Welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Peter Martin. I'm delighted to say my guest on this program is singer-songwriter Graham Skinner, better known for the lead singer of uh, Hipsway, but there's far more to the man than just one band, and hopefully we'll shoot the breeze over the next hour and get a little insight into some of the stories from the past and some uh, from the present as well. Uh, Graham, uh, Hipsway is where you have that kind of a Andy Warhol 15 minutes of fame. Um, how do you view that period uh, in the 80s when you, when you get into the madness of fame? It's a bit of a blur. I mean, um, so you want it so badly, and then when you get it, you're like, why do I really, I don't, do I really want this? Because <laughs> um, I remember, it must, there's, there's certain things that, that you remember that, that, that you're like, light bulb moments, like playing Ibrox with Simple Minds, and I think we were like maybe setting band on or something like that, but the place is full, and everybody knows the songs you're they're singing, they're clapping the along with you, and it's like plenty of, you know, 30,000 people, and they know all your music, and yeah. it was like, when did that happen? Yeah. What year was that? 86, I think that yeah. was. And then, uh, like... I think I was getting ready to go to America. He, tra he, he started doing a second album and I was getting forward about Marks and Spencer. So I was trying to buy underpants <laughs> and this wee boy was sort of falling about going. And I was like, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> I don't like this at all. Uh, you know, things like that. Um, I just, you know, obviously, you can't. It's, it's a lot more difficult to get for a pint. Yeah. You know I mean? It's funny you saying that. It gives me an insight into you. Did although you know you're singer songwriter, and at times there's been collaborations. But when you're on that uh, bandwagon trying to achieve success, was the driving force in you? I want to be famous, or was the driving force in I'd really like people to hear what we do? Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I, I don't think I think anybody who wants to be famous has got no idea what that is. Um, because it's not really, it's not really what they want. What they want is to be, you know, like, well off, escape whatever, you know, usually you're trying to escape something. <laughs> now, I, it sounds, I, I, I was thinking about this, and it sounds horrible, you know, try to escape your life, because it, it wasn't a terrible life. But um, it wasn't, you know, was, what was I going to do if I didn't do that? I was going to probably end up working in a bar or something like that. Yeah. Maybe I'd end up being the bar manager. Maybe I'd end up like buying my own bar, that sort of thing, or you know, doing something like that because I didn't have any qualifications really to speak of. Or maybe I went to college and went to university or something like that. Maybe I'd become a teacher. I don't know. But uh, it wouldn't have been as interesting as what I did. I was looking for to do something different, really. That's It was just a different life. Yeah. Maybe the other what thing. What my mum and dad had had, you know. What, 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 what were they doing that you. And sometimes it's your mum and dad and you see how hard they've grafted yeah. that you think, well, I want to get something that gets me out of the social circumstances so that we're in. My mum was an absolute grafter. And, you know, my mum and dad separated when I was about four. And my dad went away and lived up north. And he was, like, trained as a mechanic. And he hated that. When, like, you know, see his fingers all ingrained with oil and he hated doing that and he, he, he did his best to get out of it and eventually he did he, he found a different job and he found something that he, he really enjoyed doing yeah uh, but you know my mum she just she was like just brought me up by herself you know yeah. it, 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 in, in a strange sort of way and I can see great parallels because it's similar to myself did your mum have the greatest influence on you? Um, I thought the people had actually the biggest influence on me were my grandparents because um, my mum was working hard and like then at the weekends she's still a young woman so I'd go and stay with my, my granny and uh, I had two grannies and two grandpas at that when I was younger obviously they <laughs> one by one disappeared but um, I'd stay with my granny and grandpa Skinner who was my dad's uh, mum and dad and my granny Skinner was like a really unusual person because she, she was interested in things that most people of that generation, she used to talk about things like 
the Brandt North South report about <laughs> the idea that the north of the work the planet is so much richer than the south and yeah. plunder the south and take all their you know, she'd talk about stuff like that or she'd be interested in nutrition and weird things. And she was a, she was great at cooking all that stuff. So and then, you know, you always get your ice cream and your sweeties as well. So yeah, exactly. I loved it, you know, and she'd let me sit up late and watch horror for hammer horror films. <laughs> You know, Randall and Hopkirk and all that stuff. Yeah, you know I mean, it was great fun. What music were you into? Uh, well, you know, when you're young, it's just whatever's happening in the, in the charts. I remember things like, you know, 10cc and like all the glam stuff I yeah. loved. Um, and like, I actually remember somebody talking about Jim Morrison dying, right? Uh, and I didn't know who that was, but it was like, this is important. This guy's died, and then, like, you know, 10 years later, I was a huge fan. Yeah. Um, but, like, you know, my granny Wallace, I'd spent a lot of time in her house as well, and she could play the piano, right? And she used to play the piano in, like, pubs in Mary Hill Road and stuff like that. And obviously, she's playing the piano, she's not buying any drinks. <laughs> <laughs> she could play any tune just by listening to it. Right? So, she's a, she's a big influence in me. Yeah. And I remember, like, uh, Remember dial a disc? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, uh, uh, it was mud tiger feet, and I was on that all <laughs> day, man. I was like, just dial a disc. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I just kept dialing it until I got, I went, got in a wee bit of trouble for that. Yeah. How did you view your mates when you were growing up in Glasgow in the late 70s and the, in the early 80s? So I was 11, I stayed in a week sort of housing estate called Cadder, which is like part of Mary Hill, between Mary Hill and uh, Lamb Hill. Right. And uh, so it's kind of right on the edge of Glasgow. So if you go, go through the, the the backs, you're in cemeteries, and then it's like countryside. Yeah. Going out towards Bishop Briggs or Mogai or whatever. So um, you, it was a terminus in the bus, right? So you take the if you're getting on, there was always a bus waiting to go into town. And uh, but my grannies, they both lived quite close to each other, Naples Hall Street, uh, and Mary Hill, so I've always had that Mary Hill thing. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I guess like, I've always just felt Glaswegian and, and felt part of the city, but it was kind of, I didn't really go into it that much until I was about, I don't know, 14 or 15 or something like that. Did you sense at that point, or did you know that you were veering towards music in the in the in the area i mean you're 15 by the time you're getting up to the later part of your teens glasgow is coming alive i yeah. mean there's so many people into music and there's so many pathways to getting a career well um i get i mean when i'm 15 no none of that at all all you're really thinking about is like doing your paper paper round right yeah what am i going to do with that money like, you know, uh, go to the football, uh, get, pay off your, you know, made-to-measure jacket, yeah. uh, like, buy a record or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's amazing how much you could get with Yeah. <laughs> you know, you have, like, five quid or whatever. Um, and then, um, so it's just that. And then, like, when I was about, I guess I'd be about 17, 16, 17, start, like, my pal showed me, how to play some chords and a guitar and I'll, he gave me this guitar right and it was like uh, you, you'd use it as a weapon more than a, as a, a, an instrument of pleasure do you know what I mean and it, it, the strings were about that far off the, the uh, away from the fretboard and I just, but I just used it as a, a a memory thing so I just learned how to make the shapes and battered them out and then, then I finally like bought a half decent one, paid it up off at of McCormack's, you know what I mean? Were you singing at that time? No, and so the idea was that I would be a guitar player, I wanted to be a guitar player because I, I, I loved like Thin Lizzy and I loved, I mean I loved punk rock but I also loved Thin Lizzy and the Skids and Bill Nelson and all these sort of people so, yeah. I, I, so I had a, quite, I always had a broad, a broad taste in music and I wanted to be a, a, a guitar player. But uh, started this band, this guy, uh, Harry, who ended up being the drummer and uh, songwriter on Hi Hipsway as well. And um, like we started this band, we had a, a guy playing guitar and he was like shorter, shorter than me and I was like six foot three or whatever. And 
just thought, why is this, why, why see this singer and you're the guitar? He's a better guitar player than you and you're a better singer. So we just like switched, switched, over, yeah, switched over and the rest is history. Yeah, and, and with that in mind, as you get older, as you're singing, um, <clears throat> you know, did you sense that the, 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 the city was buzzing with great talent? I mean, everybody references the fact that, you know, from Johnny and the self-abusers to Simple Minds, they can see them breaking out, but there was, there just seemed to, the whole thing just seemed to explode at one point. I mean, you had Simple Minds, obviously, and that, I was still at school when they were breaking out. Then you had, uh, you know, you but even you had, you know, like, guys like Major, who's, you know, yep. uh, you know, who's in... Dead End like, Kids. Dead End Kids and all that. And that. Then uh, Orange Juice and the whole postcard thing, when that happened, like, it, it just changed everything, you know. Um, much more so for me than punk, although punk was probably the emphasis for me to start doing stuff. I actually believed it when, yeah. they, when they when they were doing you know, they were the punk thing. It was kind of like, well, you know, okay, yeah, anybody can do this, right? But when it was actually punk, I mean, what on just now that was a, was a kind of punk, an expression of punk in itself. Yeah. And when when that came out, there was guys from from your own area. You were like, I. Definitely, I'm, I'm up for this. Yeah, I can actually, I just tells you how old you and I are. I can remember buying the 12 inch of Orange Juice's Felicity, and I was just thinking to myself, this is magic. And I, and I, and I suppose, I don't know if it's, it's a Scottish thing, but you just kept, I, I just remember thinking, oh, Scottish band, brilliant, buying them. You know, you were buying lots of Scottish bands because they were, they were at the forefront. Maybe we were overly patriotic as well because you always want to see people do well. But they were good. <laughs> they were just, yeah. just really good. Uh, you know, like we were talking about the Skids. I mean, what a band they were. Oh, fantastic. I love them. Um, and I, I, you know, I met Richard Johnson a week or so ago and I, I had to tell him, like, you know, like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fanboy. And I, I said, you know, like when you're going out, when you're 19 or whatever, you're going up the town and you, your pal comes in and you're like, okay, right, we're going up Strathclyde or whatever. <laughs> You've got a tune usually. We had our, our tune was "Hurry On Boys" by the Skids, yeah, and it means a lot to me and him. That's my pal Billy. Just the lyrics and the whole thing about it, and it's funny, but it's also like means something to us. And I think it's probably the similar meaning that he actually intended. So, uh, anyway, I told him that, and he was like, oh, "That's brilliant. That's really cool." Yeah, and the other thing about it as well, <clears throat> when you are starting to sing and starting to, to look, was there a real desire from, from your point of view once you realised you've got the voice there, I want to learn how to structure songs, how to write songs, or were you looking really, you know, at your bandmates at that time? I would say I was like, I still had that kind of Scottish working class mentality <laughs> that, oh, that I can't really do that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That, that's for other people. So like when we started doing it, I mean the previous to Hipsway, I, I you know I was writing, we were all writing songs together, but I wasn't sitting down just being a songwriter like like I do now. Um, I was kind of I would have a, a wee bit of an idea and we'd form it all together, and it's, uh, to an extent that's how what Hips, Hipsway was really. Yeah, it was a lot of jamming and a lot of working stuff out and a lot of like to and froing, you know, like if you heard the how some of those songs started, you'd be thinking, <laughs> yeah. this isn't going anywhere. But uh, we, we, we were hard workers, you know. It struck me, though, that when you get into that band, although, you know, you've been in a couple of jazzeteers beforehand and you, you've been in a couple of bands, it struck me that that band was very much a kind of a team effort. Yeah. Well, the thing is, right, like, then it became, when, when that started, that was like, this is a thing, it's a professional thing. You know, I stopped working. Uh, I think pretty much Harry probably did as well. So I was I lived on my credit card for six months. <laughs> and that's what that's one of the main <laughs> driving forces for me. I like I end up like running up about five hundred pounds in credit, which is a lot of money back then. Yeah. It's probably like about ten grand now. Yeah. And, uh, maybe it's not as much as that, but it's a lot. Um it was a, certainly it was a max that I could I could you know take out and uh, so 
I was really, really needed to get a deal or yeah. I was going to have to stop soon and then I was going to be stuck with all this debt as well. Did you think it was a bonus that, that Johnny McElhone had already been in Altered Images? It's, it's a bonus and a negative because on, this, on the one hand, obviously, it's you know Johnny knows what he's doing and it's, it's like uh, being there, done it. You know, with, with Altered Images, like, it's made three hours work with guys who I consider heroes, like, Tony Visconti and uh, what's his name again? I forgot the other guy. Um, did the Stranglers and all sorts of people. Anyway, it's worked with at least two producers that I think are like, you know, top notch. And then, uh, but then on the other hand, it's a bit of a there's a deficit where it's, where he knows everything or he's done it all and you haven't, and it's yeah. like I know better than you kind of thing. So that's a difficult thing. Do you know what I mean? Because you're like, you know, he's got the, all that experience and you want the experience so you just have to get on with it though. Yeah. What was the chemistry like in the band? Well we were all different, you know, so like I mean Johnny's uh Johnny's a real really hard working and really focused and we we'd be like we'd be good at being <laughs> <party>. idiots. <laughs> he'd be like like hard working. But then we'd 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 go drinking and then we'd go back to the house and we'd work yeah. till like two in the morning th th writing words and lyrics and stuff like that. So we, we were always did our work, but we just didn't do it like at the same time sometimes. <laughs> or, it was, or as regimented it was, as Johnny wanted. Aye, no, and it's not, I'm not, it's not I'm not it's not a slag or anything. It's like uh, Johnny wasn't interested in gonna drink like that. He he liked going to see music bands and stuff like that. Like yeah out for stuff to eat and I did all that with him as well. We used to play football together, we'd go to cafes and have a, you know, had a, had a whole thing together and then he'd go home with, to his uh, girlfriend and we'd go in the rest. <laughs> you know I mean? So we did all the stuff together and then we did other stuff separately, do you know what I mean? It was, uh, did you feel it was going to, did you feel it was going to happen though? Aye, because um, I, it was kind of like, I think because uh, Johnny's brother Jerry was our manager, and like he he just he wasn't going to let it no happen. Do you yeah, know what I mean he's like a, they're both like forces of nature. Really, they're very like strong, uh, you know, individuals. You know what I mean? Sometimes, though, I mean, you know what it's like if you're right into music and you're speaking to people who've who've made it successful, um, or indeed they've written a song and they they actually turn around and go. Uh, this is a cracker. I know this is going to be a hit. You know, um, there are some songs like, for example, some people, Simon and Garfunkel. If you listen to their old interviews, uh, I don't think they, I don't think they thought, you know, Bridge Over Troubled Waters was going to be massive. Uh, maybe the producer in the background did, but from your point of view, when you were looking at the songs coming in that album, did you think to yourself, oh, wait a minute, this is? I think we we knew uh, when when we started doing Honey Thief, we knew that was going to be. A big hat. Yeah, but we were. I think we were kind of. I'm certainly. I'm still disappointed that Ask a Lord wasn't a bigger, you know, what a much it's bigger hat. A I great song. I think it's a great song. It's a great record, and it, it, it grinds my gear somewhat. I yeah. don't like telling you, but what can you do? Yeah, I mean, in in in, in a strange way, I, I wonder. I mean, I think that it's there are some Scottish albums that you can listen to and you think. It just isn't a bad track on. It's just great. That first album is so strong. You know, it's fine. Sometimes you think to yourself, oh, well, an album, if you get one or two hits on it, great. And some of them are fillers and then some of them are good album tracks. But it was such a strong album, wasn't it? Well, it's just that it was an album. You know what I mean? And it, I guess that was getting towards the end of that period when it, when people wanted to listen to whole albums. Um, and the... You know, the, although Honey Thief was a hit and all yeah. that, that wasn't like the driving force of the, the, the this gold album success, as it were. It was, it, it took a year to, to sell 100,000, right? So that's like 2,000 a week. So yeah, it's a slow burner. So it took, <laughs> it took that long to get to that to that stage. So, um, and that's, that's based on people saying, like, I'm guessing, you you played it to somebody and they played it to somebody and somebody else played it to somebody else and it sold. Yeah, well, uh, you and I are <clears throat> linked in one sense um, because I actually, in the early days, worked for Scottish Newcastle Brewers 
and they sent me around the UK with a video wall. And the video wall, before we started anything in clubs and nightclubs and pubs, before we even started the show, we had to play the McEwen's Lager advert <laughs> with, a, with, a, with a ball rolling, you know, and then in comes Tinder. And uh, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, I love that song. I mean, it's, if you're thinking you wanted Ask the Lord to be a, a, a massive hit, I wanted Tinder because I just thought it had it just a brilliant melody. The way you sang it was magic. I still do. I do that acoustically. Yeah. I, it works as an acoustic song. It's interesting. And they pick up, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, if you speak to Ricky Ross, he's talking about his back catalogue from Deacon Blue, which they're in fortunes. But yeah, he writes a bit of music, I'm told. I think he told me once he wrote a bit of music for a James Bond movie and it made him just as much money as the entire Deacon Blue back catalogue. You know, so that's why I'm looking to him saying to myself, Tinder, did it help along the way of that album as well as The Honey Thief? I which guess is that must have been. That's almost <laughs> like having a... I hit in a way. Yeah. It's, although I don't remember like getting much money out of it, but um, I wasn't really concerned about money to be honest with you, because um, you were getting your your advances and stuff like that, and I was earning way more money than I would have if I was an apprentice or I just started doing some other job or whatever. So uh, I was well happy, um, and what well, what we did get for that record uh, for that. Uh, that advert was a thousand cans of that McQueen's Lager. And <laughs> Which is great for you, but not for Johnny. <laughs> well, aye, exactly. But I remember uh, we, when we got it, we was, we'd just done, finished doing a show. I think we'd done a tour, and it was we, we were having a party uh, down in the sub club after it. And so we just took all that lager down and let everybody drink it. I don't know why the sub club let us take Take that in there, but uh, you, know, you just all got right. I guess we just hired the sub club, and <laughs> that's how it worked. But uh, aye, <laughs> the album itself is—I uh, mean, it's iconic for a lot of people in Scotland. Certainly, most of my mates absolutely love it. What What was the? And of course, Honey Thief would, would have been—you know—you've got America as well. That, that starts aye, that to was America. Aye. You know, what was that like? Going to America. Uh, it was a uh, well. The first time I went, we just went as as a went to like two or three different uh, towns to towns, cities to 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 do promotion and stuff, and you know I was okay, um, but I, I really enjoyed going and playing live because that turned us into like that really good live band. Yeah. Um, but it also kind of broke the band up. <laughs> 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 what because because you have to tell well, each other? No, just, <coughs> I mean Johnny had already left the band by that point because um, we we'd, we'd done a tour, a two month tour with uh, Eurythmics is opening for them, and we, we we that that was a a real sort of musical gym as well. Yeah. So we were fighting fit after that, but then Johnny he, he decided he had enough of lurking about, and um, went away and formed Texas. Was that a clash of personalities? Did you did you know it was coming Kinda, to an end? You know, I mean, <clears throat> you know, was, we we had a we had we had a, we a great baby. Yeah. You know I mean? <laughs> so uh, I don't think I don't I don't think Johnny looks back on it like with any sadness because he's part of something great and we're part of something great. So yeah. It's not you worked out. you he's, mentioned he's now part of something. Mega. Yeah. You, know? you mentioned the other, <clears throat> I mean, you were talking about, you know, being the support act for Simple Minds in your mix. Did you, f not that you would feel on a par with them because of their back catalogue, but did you feel as if you were part of that crew then? You were part of that group of Scottish talent that was busting out? Well, I kind of, I wanted to be. I don't know. Um, they, I mean, they were so, so much on a different level. You know, they were they were dead sweet and nice and all that. And, yeah. Uh, what Annie Lennox? Yeah, really nice person. Um, didn't see a lot of her, but she was cool. She'd come and ask you stuff like, you know, what's the stage like and like, you know, if there's something weird going on or what. She'd she'd come and ask you how what it was like and things like that. So I uh, she was really nice. Um, can't speak, like I say, didn't spend a lot of time with her. Dave Stewart would come and see us a lot more. He was a bit more. Hands on, he'd come in with a bottle of champagne or whatever. Yeah. 
regale us with a few stories and you end up being really good pals with well, one of my best pals, Bobby Hodgins, Bobby Bluebell. Yeah. Um, so, I uh, he, he he likes the jocks, does old Dave. <laughs> yeah, he well, must. <laughs> He's hung about with one for long enough. What about what about Jim Kerr and Charlie Burchill? Because from from my point of view of knowing them um, and being in their company, even you know, every time I see them, I think to myself, my God, you you two guys look as if you just left Tory Glen yesterday. They, just don't seem to change. It's the greatest compliment I can pay to them. Yeah, well, I never, I never spent a lot of time with, with with Jim or Charlie. Although I did, you know, I did speak to them a couple. Of, you know, because it was. I remember getting down to the south of France, and, and they were there, and we, we all sat and had a few drinks and that, and it was really nice. But it's a, it's a different. You know, we were we only did like four shows with them: two in the south of France and two at Ibrox. Yeah. So uh, didn't really get to hang out with them that much. But Zali, my the guy who, uh, I mean. They were at the same school as Johnny, yeah. and Jerry, you know. So I, th- I think maybe they're just a wee bit older. Maybe Johnny at the same age as, as uh, Jerry. So they knew them. Like they went to school with them and yeah. stuff like that. So that's some school, that by the way. Yeah, so they churned. Ridiculous. They churned them out, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they got, you know, all the damages, simple minds, primal scream. Do you know what I mean? Like that. And then what? there's a couple of guys in my first band went to that school as well. Is that right? Put your, put your hand up if you're musically talented. <laughs> Boom, you're in. We used to rehearse in the gym. When we first started uh, rehearsing, we used to rehearse in the, the gym at, at the school. So yeah. It's ridiculous. Did you, uh, you mentioned there, you said you were you were in America. Did you like the culture of it? I Well, I mean, I loved American bands, especially yeah. particularly from New York, but also a lot a lot. As I got older, I got to really like the the uh, West Coast stuff. But when I was younger, I, I really loved the West, the East Coast, the you know, Blondie, television, dolls, and all that stuff. Talking Heads, yeah, huge fan of them. So, will you go my, and see them? My, my idea, my ideal would be like to live in New York. Yeah, that was where I want. I wanted to be from New York. Well, was there a temptation to try and? Well, we, went, we did go and live there for a while. We lived there for a year, made a record there. But, um, and so I kind of got totally, felt totally at home there. I could pals there, I'm American pals there and stuff like that. And I'd go to places and they knew me and stuff like that. Yeah. The greatest, I mean, I don't know if it'll last 10, 20 years, Graham, I might as well tell you now. Um, when you go and see on a, on a nostalgia trip, some bands and you think oh i loved them when i was younger i was at school and i'll go back and see them and then they just don't quite cut it um i can remember we were me and my pal martin and a few others were, were sitting well we we're standing in the admiral and you waltz onto that stage this is couldn't be that long ago maybe about four years ago and you waltz onto that stage as if you just started with hips way the week before and you belt out the songs and i remember looking to my mate and i went he still fucking got it. He still <laughs> got it. He, he still he can reproduce the song. It's 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 one of those things where you don't want people to go on too long. You want them to be able to, you know, hit I, still hit the heady heights. Is that something? You don't want you don't want to see Mick Jagger in a wheelchair, right? <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> he's just defying. <laughs> he defies logic I, with Keith not. Richards. I don't, neither of those two are human. Yeah, there's something there's something bizarre going on with them too. Do you still do it for the love of it? Oh aye, aye. I mean not exactly rolling in the money, but like I mean when we were doing Hipsway for a for a while when we came back, like I was sort of making enough money that I didn't have to work. Yeah. Um so I'd, what had happened was I had been running a bar called the the Rio Cafe in Highland Street and this guy came in and he said, look, I work for this, I, I do these reissues, uh, how do you feel about I want to do a reissue of the Hipsway album? Uh, and I was like, well, hang on, it was, it's not going to, it's no big skin off my nose. Yeah, you absolutely. He said, I know, but I need you to help me just like do some interviews and stuff like that. I said, like, okay, no worries. Yeah. So I did this whole thing and it made me think about the whole, like kind of about like what we're doing now, to be honest with you. And so he could put the liner notes together and things like that. And, uh, Did you have to get the whole band's consent? Um, no, because you don't really need, I don't think you really need anybody's consent. It was just like he wanted my approval so that he could like get a story to put in the, the record, make it interest. Yeah. And uh, 
you just need a license. Yeah, it's a record company that own the license. So um, they, um, I did the whole thing with them, and then, like, long story short, the employment with that particular establishment came to an end. Uh-huh. I was like, "What am I going to do now?" I was like, "Well, this record's coming out. Why don't I see if I wants to, you know, let's get the band back together yeah, again, absolutely. the Blues Brothers." <laughs> So I was like, I had to talk him in here, right? I yeah. was like, it's as charming as I've ever been. And I really had to talk him in here and like persuade him because he really wasn't interested. Because playing guitar like, the way he does is yeah. a physical thing, you know. Your fingers have to be strong and toughened up and all that. And he had to, he had to sort of work himself back up into that situation because there's an hour and a half of like, like grafting for him. It's easy for me. Uh, and then... It was like, okay, right, who's going to play and all that? Well, we'll get Gary, who had been playing with us previously. And then Gary said, oh, well, I know this guy. And it wasn't working out with this other guy. And right. I said, look, I want, this is the guy I want to get in. And it was a guy called Jim McDermott, who you'll be familiar with Jim's work. He's, you know, Kevin McDermott's brother. Yeah. And he plays with Delamitri and all sorts of people. And I, as soon as he hit the snare, it was like... You're off and running. Pim was like, "That's what I want to hear." Yeah, yeah. And and did you feel when you get back into the the old suit? Did you just feel ah? I I mean you know it's amazing that you can't remember what you did last week, right? But you can remember all those words in order, almost like that. Do you know what I mean? It's it's incredible how ingrained they are in you. See the album itself. I mean, of people that I've spoken to before. <clears throat> you've mentioned the you know the chemistry of the band the different styles what you like doing some of the boys like to laugh Johnny was more serious <clears throat> and, and then you're putting the album together sometimes in it's raw sense you're thinking okay you've told me it's I know there's a couple of really good songs in here how important then do you think it was that that album was eventually put together with a wee bit of the wee bit of backing the producers the effect, you I know. think the producers were <clears throat> very important. Yeah, Lang and O'Duffy, yeah. you know. Both of them, like, they're totally different, right? I mean, they're they're completely different people, but uh, and you kind of you can kind of see, like, with Lang and started Honey Thief, started Ask a Lord, and he started uh, Broke News, but he didn't have anything to do with the other songs. Yeah. So, like, you can. If you if you if you know it, you can you can see a wee bit of the, the, the different influence. But um, but at the end of the day, it's really Paul Duffy's production that the, the makes it special. Uh, he, Soulful. I mean, he kind of I because he was in, he he was a kind of like it's a weird guy because he, he's like he's a young white guy. He's probably about the same as as us, but he'd been doing sort of soul records and stuff like that. So he kind of brought a bit of that sh- soulful uh, sparkle. You know, so made it special. I yeah. think he, you know, he definitely did something. Yeah. Paul McCartney says it's very difficult to pick a favourite song from his back catalogue because <laughs> he views the songs as his children. Yeah. Um, is it is it going to be tough for you if I ask well, you that that's, question? That's what it, I mean, it's like you're thinking about songs and what songs are and how they come about. And I, I mean, obviously, I knew I was coming here, so I was thinking about it a wee bit, and I'm thinking of how. Like when you write a song and stuff like that, and like you know, like you need a, a, a it's a seed, you know, it's a, it could be a seed, but that seed could be anything, it could be a phrase, it could be a, a riff, it could be like a feeling or whatever. So you need that seed, um, and then it'll either grow or it won't. But like you need to put a lot of work into it usually. Uh, my favorite song that I, that. Just Hipsway songs or any songs? Well, give me Hipsway first of all. My favourite Hipsway song, I think, is, well, off that album, Ask a Lord. Yeah. The bass line's absolutely brilliant, and I love the lyrics and the feeling and the energy, and so, and you can still play it, and you can play it acoustically, or you can play it with like synthesizers and guitars and loud drums or whatever. So. Yeah. Do you know what it needs, by the way? It needs 
it needs somebody for that school again to go and produce movies and put it in a movie. It's almost like, I mean, the Proclaimers yeah, sure. got Benny in June, uh, you know, I think it was 500 miles or whatever, suddenly he's in a movie and then people rediscover a song. It was, uh, the, the guy who was a kind of marketing guy, he he kind of marketed it as a, as a, a cinematic experience. It <laughs> he had, feel was, like it, I know. There was a whole thing about it, you know, we did mixes and all that, they were meant to be like this, you know, the film soundtrack version and all that sort of thing. So I, I did have a cinematic quality. Yeah. But we, we were all big into going to the, the movies, all, yeah. all us in the band. So. What, what's the favourite song out with Hipsway? Because <clears throat> it, you know what it's like, Graham, everybody um, sometimes just zones in. The mass audience who buy your albums um, will be into the biggest part of it, which is Hipsway and that album, and maybe to a lesser extent the second album. But uh, from your point of view, What's your favourite song out with? Out with that? Um, well, I'm a, I've got a, a band that I've started with, with my pal Douglas in the 90s. Then that got sidelined and blah, blah, blah. Didn't do much for a while. Uh, and now it's sort of reignited again. And so we're, we're actually working on a new album together just now. But uh, we did a record in the 90s called uh, My Life as a Dog, and there's a song on that that's just a wee short song, it's quite quiet, and it, but it's just a wee perfect song. It's called uh, My Life as a Dog, and it's, it's not got any guitar solos or anything, it just starts and it finishes, and it's just a beautiful wee piece of songwriting. It's you and Douglas on guitar, isn't it? Aye. Yeah, yeah. What about, um, what about the music industry? Do, do you like it? Did you like it? Did you conform to it? Or were you, in some ways, quite rebellious of what they were trying to get you to do? Yes, like, it's a weird thing because, again, you know, you, you always talk, you talk about these things like you, you, you strive for something and then when you get it, you don't want it, you know what I mean? Like, the journey's always better than the actual the arriving. And when... I realised kind of what the music business was like. I didn't like it very much, and I don't like it very much. But I love making music. So. Yeah. Like now, I'm in a much happier place because it just I just make records, and I'm not really I don't have any expectations, and nobody has any expectations about them being mega successful or anything. That's not what it's about. It's about doing something that you enjoy doing, and if I can do a gig and make a couple of hundred quid, that's fine. Yeah. Because uh, I'm going to enjoy myself. But like I remember, like when we had. Uh, We'd moved to A and M at this point. We'd followed an A and R man, right? The guy who signs you to A and M, and he uh, he had just left A and M to go somewhere else and left us high and dry. <laughs> so we're like sitting there with nobody representing you. It's like it's like when you lose your manager almost yeah. in a football team or something like that. It's like you're, you're kind of like rudderless. Yeah, it's like Brian Epstein dying at the Beatles. Aye, you're like you just uh, the, there's no focus. And so I was kind of like, I remember like going out with the guys and, and I was giving them absolute pillars because we weren't getting what I thought we deserved in terms of promotion and stuff. And of course, pretty soon after that, we got absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but we, if that had been our manager doing it, yeah. it might have been okay. But of course, coming for me, it wasn't good. So it, that was a big mistake. But, you know. I had a good, had a good night doing it. I <laughs> got it off my chest. <laughs> you, you, what was there any? While you were on that roller coaster, was there any advice that kept you sane? Was there anybody that passed on in, or was it really no. just being, <laughs> was it just being on I the was, roller coaster? Just mental. I, yeah? I'm, I, I only, I've, I've said this about three or four times in the last month or two because I've been talking, hanging out with people and talking about various things, and and, and I keep saying it if. If I'd been successful, like mega successful, like I don't know, Elton John or something like that, I mean, that's a ridiculous amount of experience, you know, but like even, you know, Texas, yeah. I'd probably be dead. <laughs> Why? Because I would have just, like, <laughs> took loads of drugs and drank loads and been a complete idiot. <laughs> Instead, what happened was I had to get, I go back to the real world and I became 
probably a, a bit more of a rounded individual. Yeah, uh, that, just on those two quick points. Now that you say you sing it, you sing the songs because you love them. You're enjoying it. The expectation isn't as great, but you must still get a kick out of somebody saying, "By the way, that song that you wrote, I like it." Yeah, it's it's, it's a gas. Yeah, um, like now, like this, you would never do this back in those days. You would never like be go after a show. Go and stand behind a table and sell your records to somebody individually and talk to them and sign them and stuff like that. Now that's like just part of what you do. Yeah. You know I mean, Lloyd Cole, he like, God knows how many hits has Lloyd Cole had. You know? he, he, he's, a, oh. he's a right good few. He's a right good few. He still does that. He, when he finishes a show, he goes to the merch stand, he talks to his fans, he writes, he signs CDs, he, he help, you know, does photographs and all that. Because that's the way it is now. Just before I get to the mad questions that I've put together for you, would you change anything? To be honest, no, I don't think I would. Like, because, like I say, where would it be, you know? I don't know where, I, I don't know where I'd be. Yeah. I'd probably be a bit, I could probably, I'm sure I could have been a bit nicer than that. Yeah. Occasionally, you know. What? Yeah. what? Any, <laughs> Did you get to that any point? Any moments where I was unkind, I'd like to take them back, right? But like, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think, I, I've never really been like a, a totally nasty person, but... I guess you know if there was if there was any times that I've been horrible or something, I'd, I'd like to take them back. But I don't imagine it's too many times. Yeah, uh, because sometimes you can fall foul of it. You don't realise it because the fame's coming. People want a, a bit of you, and you you kind of a, sometimes get that sense of it's closing in on you. So, aye, aye. You know. or just you know, just lacking in patience or whatever. I think you're better than you are or whatever. Yeah. See, on that point, you you, <clears throat> you undoubtedly in the, in the at the time, just before you kicked off, you were been at, you were been at the Rock Garden on more than a few occasions. When you look back, you talked about a school producing talent at the Rock Garden. You mixed with some some right. Oh, it was good. great the Rock Garden. I wrote a song in the 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 most recent Hipsway album called Down in the Garden. Yeah, and it's all referencing it's referencing all the bands and the music we were listening to. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, I remember like we used to go in there after we'd be rehearsing. We'd, we used to rehearse next door to Justin Curry and Delamitri in the Washington Art Centre, and we'd all walk up to the Rock Garden going for a few pints. I remember going in there, and we kind of knew friends, not friends again. Um, ah, friends again, right? Yeah. Kind of knew friends again a wee bit, and uh, Harry and James were in the same uh, like yopper acting thing, you know, like. It's a six month thing when yeah, they get to act and they get paid like a or whatever. It's like, like a YTS game. Aye, like yeah. do we how uh, plays at the school or whatever. And uh, they were in the same uh, so and so was Blythe Duff from Tiger and there's a couple of other people. And then uh you gonna and then I remember them coming in and playing their demo and it was like, Oh that's amazing. We we need to up our game. <laughs> Bluebells would be hanging out, all the damages. That's how I got into all these sort of people. So it was, it was great fun. Are you still pals with anybody in the industry? Um, in the actual music business, yeah. No, not really. I don't really keep in touch with anybody like that. I mean, I'm still pals with all the guys in bands. Yeah, you know, James obviously and Bobby and you know, I saw Justin quite recently in the street and we had a wee chat and came to my show last week, two weeks ago. Um, so I, you know. All the talk to all the bands and that, but none of the the business heads really. See, when you mentioned there, you talk to the bands. I mean, obviously, a lot of them that you'll be close to have still got the 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 you know they're from from your area, they're from your country. Was there anybody you met that exceeded your expectations because of you maybe had a preconception of what they would be like? And are, is there anyone you met that was just a total prick? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. Aye, <laughs> uh, turn it off. <laughs> no, it, see, to be honest, I mean, the first time I met Richard Jobson, I didn't really like him, and I, I loved him. Yeah. yeah. I loved his music and all that. But I, that was a point, that was me being a dick, basically. Yeah. Can I swear on this? Ah, you can. <laughs> uh, I mean, I know I can swear, but I don't, I don't want to get edited. Uh, so... It was me being a dick because he wasn't like he, he just sort of, he said something slightly dismissive, 
and and I took it to heart when I should have just let it go. Yeah. Like, it wasn't that important. Then I met him again and he was really nice as nights and then I met him again and he was great. So he, he, the more I've met him, the, the more I've liked him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that might be an instance of it. I haven't really, you know, it's like, can't think of anybody that are, like, there must be somebody. Yeah. I don't it's, mind sticking in it. I don't mind sticking in no, it. No, I mean, I, listen, I get the Richard Jobs because I think Richard Jobson, I mean, for me, I'm a huge fan of the skid, so he was as cool as ice. Aye, he's you cool. know, um, I, I just thought he was uh, magnificent. Um, but sometimes, you, you know, when you meet your heroes, they don't quite live up to it. And you, or you meet somebody who's mega famous and you well, think, mm. Well, I met, I've, I've met, I met Ian McCall a couple of times and I didn't really hit it off. Hit it off with him. So and and I was a huge huge fan. I really was hoping, like, oh, that we could be part. <laughs> he was like a hero to me, right? Yeah. yeah. So that that was a disappointment. I, I did, you know, I didn't really get a groove with him because because uh, I love his music so much. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, here comes the questions that are going to um, really test you. And of course, the other thing is, since you mentioned there that you don't really care if you. <laughs> If you upset people, <laughs> you've only get five, so don't, so don't give me oh, six, I, right? I, I know, I'm not. I'm not I'm you've only got five, so Graham Skinner, five top Scottish songs performed by a band or an artist. Okay. Into the Valley, Skids. Uh, Boston Tea Party, Alex Harvey. Let's see. Uh, come on, think of a band. Uh, Blue Boy, Orange Juice, Falling and Laughing, no, not Falling and Laughing, Sorry for Love, Joseph K, and I've, I've got to have a Blue Bell song in there because uh, it'll do you in if you I, don't. <laughs> so I'm going to go with uh, Aiming Life. Right, okay, that's a good five, and for the benefit of anyone who's been left out, Tough shit. It's as simple as that. So your top five songs of all time. Right. Well, this is just bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> as is that that list isn't bullshit, but it's just like uh, that was a uh, no. Uh, I didn't sit, I didn't prepare for that one. This one, you, you might as well. You know. I know. Change. How many? Have you got kids? One. Right, so I can't ask you what is your favourite. Right? <laughs> I know, but it, what is your favourite? No, but exactly. But it changes. From, I know what you're going to say. It changes it's, from week it's to impossible. week. Of course, I'll, I'll just say five songs. Five songs that you would never get pissed off. Five listening songs to. that I love. Right? Okay. Uh, this town ain't big enough for both of us. It sparks the first record I ever bought. Uh, I wanted to have another from Jeepster. By T Rex, which is what probably the first record that I really was like, it totally excited me. You know, like I mean, I, I like music and I could hear music and I loved it and all that. But like, I was like, well, who who made? I had to go and find out about that. And my mom would have remember the Weekly News. Yep. <laughs> full, of, it. full of crap. Aye, it was garbage. <laughs> <laughs> you'd have like a, but it would have like a double page spread on Mark Bowen and T-Rex and his corkscrew hair and all this garbage <laughs> and uh, and it used to have the, the um, crossword but with no clues it was just the answers <laughs> <laughs> they were all five letter answers and you had to fit them in that was, that was my idea uh, a crossword right so two that's two so far um, let's have Can't get you out of my head, Kylie. Wow. I love that. Yeah. Uh, and I've already given you a skid song, not, so they're not getting in again. Uh, what about when the levee breaks? Let's have one. Right. And one more. <laughs> it's and, so like and, and the funny thing is, I, I'm boy. getting so full out of you uh, yet. I was just going to say, I need to do a wee, I need to have a soul song, yeah. so I uh, held it through the grapevine. Right, that's not a bad five, right? And now the, the last two, um, I think, uh, are quite good because it gives me an indication if you're now, you're now after this interview, you've been past your, you've been a pain in the arse, you've been famous, <laughs> so you've passed that, you're now happy, give me three people, living or dead, you're going on a road trip down the west coast of America. You might stop at the Troubadour. You might, you know, go up Laurel Canyon. 
give me three people that are in the car with you from anywhere. You know, it doesn't necessarily need to be music. Well, hands down, I, I don't, I don't, I can't, I can't imagine anybody from my background not saying Billy Connolly. I just can't imagine how any, you wouldn't want to be in the car with Billy Connolly. Uh, he, he's, he's a genius. I probably had his record. Probably exactly the same time I started buying record. I had that. I had a double album, and I listened to it to death. And I had the Sparks album, and I had like uh, Alice Cooper, Billy Dobby. They were the only records I had, and I played them to death. Yeah. And I knew that whole thing back to front. And I, I learned so much about the world from listening to that record. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. Who else? Um, I feel like I, if there's only three. Three. And you. Aye. So you're driving, Conley's in the front seat, you're now, <laughs> you're now pissing yourself laughing, right. and the other two in the back. <laughs> Who else? Oh, this is horrible. It is, it's good, isn't it? Aye. Such a good it's question. A, sadistic. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I, I think it'd be good to have a, a sports person, you know, um, what about your hero? Who is my hero? Sport. Well, I love got my my I, I love football, but right. I, my favourite sport is golf. Um, you know, like, you must have a football hero. Well, millions, but uh, David Cooper. So Cooper's in the back now. Just to find out, and I don't know what he's like. He was a brilliant guy. Um, I, I used to DJ at his, uh, I think it was a squash club, and they used to all get together, and Davey would give me 20 quid above the fee that he gave me. Um, and I thought to myself, now 20 quid in the 80s was a lot of money, Graham, as you know. And I used to think, wow. And uh, my brother was a big Motherwell fan, so he was at Rangers, he was a genius. Uh, he was Went to Motherwell when people thought he was finished. And he was just unbelievable. He, so, I mean, like he came to my sort of knowledge when he was still at Clyde Bank because I'm a, wow. I was in Drumchapel then. Yeah, and so that's like a local team, and that's who I ended up going to see when I couldn't take the sectarianism anymore. At yeah, Ibrox. of the madness. So I was, I was like, I can't be dealing with this. So I started going to see Clyde Bank instead, yeah. and it was much more enjoyable. See, especially when they used to sing a. Uh, like Ask a Lord at me, that was great fun. But uh, I, but he wasn't playing with them then. He he'd moved to Rangers by that point. But he was brilliant to Rangers. Aye, he was fantastic. He's a different class. And I'd never heard anything bad about him, and he, you know, it was so like sad how he how he passed and all that. You'd struggle actually, uh, Graham, to hear anybody saying negative about yeah. him. So you've got Conley there, you've got Coop. You'd need to stop because he'd want to put a tenor on at the bookies. <laughs> <laughs> so, say so there's two. Okay, and, uh, I've got to have okay. a woman. I was going to say. I've got to have a woman. So, uh, But we can't have Pamela Anderson because she'll just tell Billy to shut up. Yeah. Uh, right. Oh, this is, see if I had a wee bit of prep. I know, but that's the great thing about it. It's got to be somebody that's out of left field. It could be a movie star. Aye, well, it's going to have to be. Yeah. Um. Favourite female movie star? Bette Davis. Wow, you've got three totally different personalities in that car. You and know? she'd be a right girl. Oh, absolutely, she would. And she wouldn't be. She, she would give Connolly a run for his money. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't be short of opinion. Okay, not a bad one. Right, I'm giving you two tickets for any concert, for any band or artist, living or dead. Oh, God. Um. I mean, I'd have loved to have seen, like, the Stones in the late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. You know when they just when they, when they started playing with big PA's and you could hear them and it wasn't just people screaming. People were going to listen to them. Yeah. And they'll just like throw their scans at them. Yeah. I don't think there's any point in going to see it. You couldn't see you, the Beatles never did a show like that. No. Do you know what I mean? But you could never hear them. Just a waste of you. It'd have been exciting, uh, but like you, for an, an actual oral experience, it, it would have just been like bust your eardrums yeah. and people screaming. So, Stones? Uh, definitely, I'd love to see them. 
at their peak, which I consider like, you know, 71, that kind of time. Right, okay. Uh, and who else would I love to, just one other band. Uh, it'd have been great to see Hendrix when he was like, or maybe one of those soul reviews when they came over. Yeah. That's two answers, so. Yeah. Uh, I'm letting, I'm letting you fit them in. <clears throat> That's not bad. I've only got two tickets for you, you know, calm, calm your jets. So we're just about to finish. I've thoroughly enjoyed it because it's great to get a wee insight into the career. I know you're still playing now. Um, is there still that enthusiasm, that motivation, um, getting a kick out of writing the songs, seeing it come to its conclusion and then delivering it? And yeah, it? totally. Um, I've got two projects going at the moment that I'm really focused on. One is my band called The Cowboy Mouth, and that's where my pal Douglas McIntyre, who I've known for 40 odd years, and two guys that he went to school with, and they're the rhythm section. And we rehearse out in Stone House and his uh, sort of farm. And then, so we just started doing an album, and we totally love it. And the, the guy who's uh, recording it, he's, he's a musician himself, and uh, Stuart McLeod, he's been in a bunch of bands, plays with he and Cry and people like that. And he he's like, oh, this is a, I love this, this is record's great. I really love these songs. So that's really given me a good feeling that somebody that I respect really likes it. And then I've done this other thing with, with Robert, Bobby Bluebell, um, and it's kind of like a COVID record, but we did it after COVID. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's like a strip back back in tracks, and it's all Scottish bands, which kind of kind of like what we were talking about. Yeah. Um, and it's all Scottish, songs written by Scottish people. Um, and there's so many to choose from again we were like well look at all the things we've left out and um, and i'm it's, my voice is front and center so right. you know, things like is it coming out soon uh, hopefully hopefully around about christmas time i hope brilliant so it's uh it'll be, it'll be interesting. we've done simple minds we've done all just things like that we've, but we've also done marmalade and uh, donovan and you know things that people might not know so well so yeah brilliant listen um Graham, it's been an absolute blast. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's, <clears throat> as you well know, sometimes you get to do things that are a labour of love, and this was one of them. I wish you every success in the future, um, and for the past that you, you know, delivered joy for me in my teen years at school. Um, I'm forever grateful. I think it was somebody else who delivered the joy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Pleasure. Top man. <laughs>